and I want to thank you everybody for your patience. Uh, my name is Eric Mesa, and I am the current uh, Borderlands coordinator of the Sierra Club organization. We are a part of a bigger coalition that we represent civil rights, faith, environmental, indigenous, LGBTQ+, and border communities working together to protect the community, the culture, the land, the wildlife, and the environmental well-being of our border region. We are also partnering together with the Community Food Bank. And it's an organization local from Tucson that provides emergency food assistance to our community and helps to connect our neighbors to other resources like SNAP, healthcare, rent assistance, and much more. I just want to give a special shout out to the community organizing team of the Community Food Bank and the Beyond Land Acknowledgement team that continually engage and listens to communities in a deeper level and in order to work with root causes of why is hunger in our borderlands. I want to also make a special mention to Casa Carmelita, a community space supporting bi-national mutual aid efforts in Ciudad Juarez and El Paso. And of course, also to all the different organizations that join us today as well. And more than anything beyond the organization as we show up as individuals that are concerned about all the levels of social and environmental damages that are happening right now in our borderlands regions. Thank you all for being here. The purpose of the Sacred Territories webinar series is to bring local and international attention to indigenous struggles in their fight to defend land and water on both sides of the border. The hope of doing this is to build connections, solidarity, and gather support for communities defending their territories. The Borderlands program of the Sierra Club and the Community Food Bank are working to provide the space, be at service, and provide the resources to support First Nations with their struggles in defending sacred water and land. As we recognize that we are located in occupied land we directly benefit from it, from all the resources taken from it. So we pay respect to the elders, past and present, and all the new generations. So I would just like to, before we start, to take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migrations, and settlement that bring us together here today. Thank you all. So as I won't have the time to go around and do everyone introductions, which I will love, but time is limited. You're welcome to drop something on the chat, something like, where are you from? What land do you occupy? And any words of support that you would like to share with our presenters today, that would be great. Uh, we will have our presentations, and then we will have time for questions at the end. Questions will be put in the chat, Please try to make uh, concise questions, but if something uh, it's not clear to our presenters, you might be asked to unmute yourself and clarify uh, or expand into the question a little bit more. And well, with no more to say on my behalf, I would like to give the space to Nelly Jo, who's gonna start and let her be the one telling us about her story and the work that she does. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Eric. Um, <clears throat> Hi, my name is Nellie Jo David. Um, my mother um, comes um, from Autumn heritage on both sides of the border. And my father is from European heritage. Um, <clears throat> I uh, grew up in Ajo, Arizona. And uh, Eric, if you can maybe start the slide if, if it is available. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in Ajo, Arizona, which is uh, Hiachir Autumn territory. Um, just uh, a little bit north of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, I grew up, uh, you know, in the early 80s uh, during a time of when the copper mine was, was uh, closing in Ajo. There were strikes, there were violence, there was all kinds of uh, strife going on when I was in the womb. And... Um, when I was a baby, the mine, the copper mine in Ajo, the open pit copper mine, uh, shut down permanently. And so um, I grew up in the aftermath of a boom. 
uh, copper boom. And um, one of the things I'm writing about currently is how um, copper mining is tied into militarization and how um, you know it helped lead into what we have today with um, you know so many human rights abuses on the border patrol with the border patrol and um, the border wall, the integrated fixed towers, and all of the militarization um, was uh, you know here or it was brought to you by um, an origin in mining. And so um, those are my roots and you know how I, I kind of came to do what I do. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so Ajo is a Hiachid Otham territory. It's on the west uh, end of Otham territory. Um, Dono Otham means desert people. Hiachid Otham means sand people and Akima Otham means uh, river people. And then we also have uh, connections with, um, you know, uh, other peoples that have mixed with our own, the, the Akumel folks. And, um, you know, on, in those areas, um, the people living there can go, go deeper into those histories. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a very large people. Our land mass um, extends, um, you know, beyond, um, beyond the border. Um, and um, the area that I'm from, the area where they put the border wall recently was on Hiachiratam territory, where we don't have a reservation and we are not a federally recognized tribe. Um, there was a moment out in uh, two, around 2014 where the Hiachiratam uh, had a district within the Tona Atam Nation. Many Hiachid are enrolled within the Tono Atam Nation. They're also enrolled in uh, Salt River and Hilla River tribes. And we also have Hiachid Atam, um, part of the Atam communities in, in, in Mexico. And we have several unenrolled Hiachid Atam that um, have their histories out towards the, the Yuma, California area. Um, there's a lot of uh, families out there that are, um, you know, still, still there, they're still, uh, you know, descendants of um, what once was in the area that is now, um, you know, the the Ajo, Arizona, the Cabeza Prieta Wildlife Refuge, the Barry Goldwater Bombing Range, and um, the Oregon Pipe National Monument, and the west areas of the reservation. All of those areas um, did not have borders, and uh, we were free to travel and be as people. And because um, of the mining and all of the uh, recent occupation of the land, a lot of our, our recent history has been er erased, but not uh, completely. And we definitely uh, want to honor, you know, all the families that are still here and recognize that, um, you know, what land we are on and what land the, the border wall uh, went through and also, you know, disregarded and disrespected when it undertook such a major um, incident. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so this picture is of me as a baby. I'm the little uh, little one wearing my ASU gear or my family had me in my ASU gear. It's probably why I went to ASU for undergrad. Um, <clears throat> and we're sitting on the stoop of where um, they bulldozed um, uh, right in that area. It's called Mexican Town and then uh, further um, towards uh, the A Mountain is an uh, Indian village. And those areas where basically all the brown folks lived, um, the, all of that area was bulldozed once the mine was closed down. It was actually, from what I hear, um, they were going to expand the mine. And so that's why um, they got rid of all the houses. Um, but we were raised, my cousins and I were raised to know that this is where you're from, and you know these are your roots. You're from this area. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, you know, I grew up in Ajo. My experience in Ajo was, um, you know, 80s and 90s. Um, it was where I grew up, and then 2001, I uh, went to college, and the world changed. Everything changed, and I didn't know that you know the events that happened in New York were to change my existence forever. Um, and then the early 2000s were, was, was just kind of a, a big example of, of how it changed forever. You know, I got my roots, I guess, in activism, 
Um, I remember my very first protests were, were against George W. Bush, um, the Patriot Act, and all of the changes that were being implemented in those early times. Um, and then in 2005, uh, Joe Arpaio, you know, was around the time he was ramping up his raids. Um, the Real ID Act was passed, and it had a very xenophobic roots. Um, they were trying to make sure um, undocumented folks um, in the area, um, you know, were identified. And at the very end of that act was a waiver for that Trump now used uh, to to waive uh, all the laws that he did to um, basically, you know, desecrate our area, our sacred areas. Um, so that was one of where I got my my you know, I, I really remember being upset by that. Um, there was a very small group of people that were outraged, but we were out there at that time. We were about it. And we started to see some of the, the implementations of that um, put in right away. Um, though, you know, not, it wasn't um, spoken so much of um, during the Obama administration, um, right off during the Obama administration and the beginning of the, of the Obama administration, uh, we had an increase of militarization. So some of the hopes of having George Bush out of the, the office for me, um, I was very disappointed because we just saw this huge increase and we saw the checkpoints um, and now we we haven't saw the, seen the end of it. We were told that they were temporary at that time. But, um, in the year 2000, 2008, 2007 and 2008, um, that was when we saw basically our lives change forever. Um, I'd grown up going back and forth from Ajo to Phoenix. Um, some families went from Ajo to Tucson. Some families went from Ajo to Casa Grande or Sonoita. And we all had our, our you know, city experiences where we go to on the weekends to get supplies and see our cousins who were displaced because of the mining um, displacement. And so um, that's how I grew up and the checkpoints uh, really changed my life. Um, you know, I had uh, graduated college around that time gone to Ajo every weekend, but I, I did stop going because of um, different, different incidences of harassment um, that I would experience, that my parents would experience, that my friends would experience. Um, we all just, um, not, not everybody stopped going home, obviously. There was a lot of folks that lived there, um, but I know among the class of 2001, among my, my peers that graduated 20 years ago, um, there's there's more than a few of us that stopped going frequently because of the harassment we experienced at the checkpoints. And that was really hard because we all love Ajo or love, you know, I still love Ajo. Um, and then 2010, um, that was a big year. Um, the year of SB 1070, um, there was a whole lot going on and it was really uh, difficult to give attention to one particular issue. Um, for me, it was all chaos and I cared about all of these issues that were going on in our nearby communities. Um, we had, um, you know, the schools, the, young, the children being attacked, their education. Um, you know, there were white supremacists that did not want uh, young peoples to know their roots of origin or their history. And, you know, they were vehement, um, you know, the history of, um, you know, uh, Mexican, you know, the whole, the whole history in the, in the Southwest, they were uh, going through that here in Tucson, where I'm, I'm currently um, speaking to you from. Um, in Phoenix, I was living there at the time, and I was, um, I was heavily involved in, I guess you would say activism at that time. Um, the raids were in full swing. Uh, Joe Arpaio was targeting um, Guadalupe. Um, it was very apparent that he was uh, targeting the areas where uh, brown folks were living. And uh, it was really scary. It was a really uh, terrifying time. And um, I would still be going home and uh, around that uh, Tom Horn, who was the superintendent of public instruction at the time, was targeting Ajo schools. And Ajo ended up uh, paying over a million dollars um, for basically these Trump charges of um, kids not um, having the correct papers, which, you know, they were, it was complete bull. A lot of uh, Ajo families uh, 
connected with Sonoita. We've had roots for thousands of years. It was an autumn village before it was, uh, you know, the, the place that it is, uh, Sonoita is Shonoita. And so, you know, it gets its name from an autumn origin and a lot of our villages. And in addition to um, Puerto Peñasco and all the way down to Caborca, where, um, where I have some many relatives in my family and they were also displaced uh, due to mining. And unfortunately, we got um, into the mining industry as many autumn families did because that was what you needed to do to, for survival. And in so many ways, um, mining is what, what dis displaced our families ultimately because that mining would... Uh, next slide, please. Um, so fast forward to, uh, I went to law school, I, I graduated, um, I was in this whole rush um, for one to stop the border patrol facilities, uh, you know, making its way into Ajo, which I failed at, <laughs> um, well, I mean, it was kind of an impossible dream, um, but I, um, you know, all of these things happened, there was a new facility in Ajo, there's, um, uh, you know, their housing, Arizona. And then um, there was a push for the integrated fixed towers um, during the Obama administration. Some of those, right after I graduated law school, I was contacted by uh, folks in Guwao district who were very concerned about uh, uses. And so um, that was taking place around that time. And um, so immediately it, we kind of had been dealing with trauma after trauma after trauma. And uh, keep in mind a lot of uh, uh, in and along the border and experiencing harassment because of uh, border militarization for pretty much all of our lives and see, seen it increasing. So by the time you know we came to um, um, being inaugurated and um, building the border wall, we had gone through quite a bit of trauma already. Um, and this picture right here is um, at the spring with our late friend, uh, PK. And it was in the time um, when border wall construction started, but it was not yet near the spring. And you can see how lush and full it is, how beautiful uh, in the background and um, so at the time we were experiencing that we were already very heavily traumatized from you know the towers from the checkpoints from um, heavy harassment um, we had we definitely been through it but um, to um, show up very strong against um, against Trump's border wall because all of this had already happened and this border wall was just this epitome of ugliness and just complete disregard of our that we've already experienced. And so, um, you know, we, we end up losing our, our, our friend PK um, in the early days of COVID to a car accident. Um, but um, I do want to remember him in this fight. Um, early days of uh, before everything happened um, we we were we were watching we were we were watching the spring we were praying for it we were caring about it and um, you know this is um, um, we also had uh, various uh, there were there are very many ceremonies and prayers that took take place um, you know by by many different autumn. Um, one of the ceremonies we have um, we all went into lockdown. Um, we were able to um, have a ceremony in exchange with autumn in Mexico and um, you know base that ceremony on, on the water. It was a beautiful and unfortunately you know um, now with the border wall where um, they have the vehicle barrier there. Um, we're we're unable to pose for that same picture now. We're not able to um, connect. 
uh, thousands and thousands of years we've connected. Uh, we've had uh, runners run through. We've had um, you know the salt uh, river or the salt uh, journey. Uh, we have young men taking that journey all. And along that border, um, we've had to witness the tragedy of, of a border wall going through that. And um, that's been, um, it's been really, really hard to say the least. Um, next slide, please. There quite a bit. Uh, we were, we noticed that there were no uh, cultural monitors. There were, there was really nothing. Um, stopping uh, with the tr Trump was using. We were told they were, wouldn't drill for water within the vicinity of um, Quito Baquito, but we saw these water trucks out there drilling all the time. And, and every time we were out there, they were at different areas. We saw the there was enough media capacity or environmental capacity to even, I guess, get get a, even a good estimate on you know the amount of um, but by the time um, and I didn't get to put the the picture in there, but there's various um, media that came out in July of 2020 um, just showing how depleted. of the vehicles going back and forth and they were cracking the lining of the area. And so the, the state of uh, Quito Paquito was really, really bad by that uh, summer of 2020. And uh, we were pandemic. Um, everybody was going into lockdown and um, wall workers, um, were not uh, taking precautions. Uh, there were some big wearing masks in the stores. Um, there seemed to be, you know, this consensus uh, because Trump was in power and you know law enforcement was on their side. There seemed to be this consensus that. You know, outside of the waivers, you know, they didn't even have to care about our community or respect our community. And um, there were, you know, parties, there were these big, you know, parties at the height of pandemic. Article that uh, stated that um, <clears throat> that uh, wall workers did bring the pandemic to Ajo and um, so I think that's a that's a something. 2005, when they were passing the Real ID Act and when they were talking about the waivers, one of the big scare tactics um, that um, the white supremacist folks um, that didn't like um, people with the fact that they would say these these uh, immigrants have diseases, which is a is a false thing, especially when you think of the whole history of indigenous, you know, it's you know, our whole uh, one of our biggest struggles was um, the bringing of disease. And so to have this rhetoric of uh, restricting the borders due to disease, disease. Um, it just felt like such a slap in the face um, and just so ironic um, because, you know, that, you know, that, that, oh, um, that was just really hard to watch all of that play out in the media and really not get responded to like, hey, wait a minute, you know, all of this fear mongering and here you um, that was that was quite a um, quite a quite a traumatic experience. Um, <clears throat> so around August, I believe it was the end of August, um, a group of 
who had, you know, had connections with other border tribes and had been, you know, speaking out and been doing all kinds of things to try to protect our land. Um, some folks got together. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, oh, ne oh. And uh, Stinger Bridge and Iron are, is the steel manufacturer um, that ultimately uh, constructed the steel you see in the um in I believe Coolidge um, on Acumel Autumn territory. Ironically, very close to to who um to our ancestors. He ended up uh, arrested. Um, there was this whole complex of um of an area where uh, Singer Bridge and Iron was uh, transported, uh, put up, um, and then held by by cement, um, and the cement is what required all the water. In addition to um, the roads, I guess needed to be watered down daily. And so we were watching that before our eyes. Um, we um, saw some of our brave Autumn um, community members block uh, Stinger Bridge and Iron, stop the construction. And um, a lot of uh, folks said that they were going to do direct actions that never ended up happening. Um, so when we did what we did, we definitely didn't plan it. Um, we actually, in rapid pace, um, we wanted to get out there early and just kind of scope it out. And that was pretty much what we were there doing. And, um, you know, we went to pray. We went to pray for the, the place. Um, Um, some of the entities um, involved in uh, wall construction um, were uh, Kiwit, um, and I'm sorry, this is an old slide. Were involved um, were actually Fisher Industries has several companies that were working on the same thing. Stinger Bridge and Iron, um, they were um, the ones that built the wall. But underneath of, of Kiwit is an entity called uh, Southwest Valley Constructors, and they're based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they spe specialize in large scale construction for the federal government. Um, and so the Southwest Valley construction team has a proven history of working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and U.S. Customs and Border Construction. So the point of that is that, you know, there's a lot of industry. especially um, surrounding Fisher Industries. They were uh, involved in a lot of um, for-profit schemes with the uh, scheme and there was a GoFundMe uh, put up and there was a whole scandal. Um, as you may remember, Trump shut down the government to kind of get his way um, with all of that. And so it was Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> and um, so when we did what we did, uh, we were we were pretty much at a breaking point. Um, set out there to pray. Um, I did want to prepare a video. I'm not I'm not too skilled at. Um, and I guess putting video together, but um, took the, the time while things were going to make our own little vlogs. Um, not all of them were published. Um, I don't think they're of the best you know, quality, um, but we were trying to document
when we did um, ultimately hear the construction going on, we were in separate places. We were um, praying in different areas and um, I ended up recording with anyone I might eventually, um, but I, um, I was running around uh, looking for Amber and just, um, just, you know, completely heartbroken today, they were, you know, putting that border wall across from that area, um, 200 yards from Quito Baquito on that day. And, um, all of this border wall stuff um and i'm kind of going back and forth here but all this border wall stuff has been um you know i i i guess i based my academic journey on it and i try to get involved in um the lawsuits against the border wall um but i did have a few uh hiccups along the way and at the time uh we uh, sat in a to to get my you know SJD program going. I I'm working on my my dissertation um, related to militarization and mining, and um, I failed in our efforts to stop the wall. You know, on that day where we were at, I, I really think you know, I was at this mindset that there was nothing more we can do. And so I think part left to lose, you know, um, because, you know, everything that I had gone to um, law school for um, just hadn't worked. effort that went into um, stopping what happened and, um, you know, the academic journey So, you know, we had COVID and we had the wall building and um, and we had prayer and um, and we had, you know, the I put my hope in was our our culture, our beliefs, our our himatog, our our religion, and you know, I'm not I'm probably not the best example of you know some. I'm um, but it is something. My culture is something that um, I have a deep deep respect for, and um, it's very very hard to see. Um, did you are across those border lines and, you know, you know, in through my dissertation, I was finding out why my family was displaced from Caborca and had to, you know, move at that point, it was just like, you know, this is it. We, we had to, we just had to. And so um, next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> and next slide. <clears throat> uh, we lasted about uh, two hours. The first hour we were just kind of hoping. Um, we were hoping that uh, <laughs> somebody would show up and uh, maybe uh, document really scary and um before the media showed up um the uh before the media showed up they were ready to arrest us going to use border patrol but i think because the cameras were rolling they knew that they had to get national park service officers to arrest us which they eventually did um <clears throat> and 
And so several uh, Border Patrol enforcement with the help of uh, 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 the uh, National Park Service officers uh, from the other side. And um, they didn't really have much trouble uh, just posting me right out. And I was just kind of huddled, like a little ball in there, just huddled together. And um, she got arrested. Um, we were told we were going to ta be taken to uh, Ajo, um, we first taken to Lukeville, and then out to Core Civic, um, past all of those uh, Stinger Bridge and Iron. detention center um it's horrendous inside um if you ever um i happened to take a tour um prior to my incarceration um i took a tour with um earlham border studies of um the the core civic we were given a bunch of bull <laughs> we were given a lot of bull of of how um the, what the conditions are like in there. Um, they then it's not wonderful. Um, and um, you know, it's it's a. I, I hope you know. In another time, we'll have another hour or another maybe even weekend lifetime. It's just that type of a nightmare that. Um, folks just trying to provide a better life for themselves are, are subjected to on a daily basis. Um, so our experience at, at Core Civic was uh, quite traumatic for the two. After that, we were uh, released with, uh, we're told they were pre-trial release conditions. And when we rejected to them, uh, I remember very distinctly being yelled at by the judge, you know, that, um, And, you know, he very strongly in a very uh, patriarchal way um, explained that, you know, they had, as the feds have the power to put us back into jail if we sit um, or dare not, you know, complain about it because we can be locked right back up there, you know, for the two misdemeanors. Um, <clears throat> And so for the next year, um, every month we had a check in with our pre-trials and we had to, um, we couldn't leave the state, um, couldn't go to Mexico. Um, both of us had, well, I immediately tried to make a prayer request. Um, I wanted to go to the Pinacates and um, that was denied. Um, and it was, it was a hard time. And I eventually had to, you know, we were told we were going to get a trial soon, hopefully after um, the elections, there was, you know, the trial. Not get the trial soon. I was hoping, you know, okay, maybe I could just drop out of school for that semester because it was not drop out of school, just take a, a little bit of academic leave. Um, because Of, um, and, you know, federal intrusion um, and trauma um, wasn't, you know, the, it wasn't the best uh, situation. And, and I definitely wasn't on my best. Um, in the way that I was when I, I went to Michigan State, um, I wasn't able to, you know, just uh, keep pursuing, I guess, uh, what I've been pursuing academic issues is just trying to get back on track with my life, um, you know, within, you know, the legal field, within the academic field. Um, I have, uh, you know, um, having to take the plea deal, um, Unfortunately, I really didn't want to. I um, I uh, I wanted to fight the closure order, you know. 
spoke the powers that be, um, the prosecutor, you know, repeatedly during Amber's trial said, you know, they could have, they could have gone the legal avenue, they could have gone the legal route. Uh, well, you know, the student loan debt to prove it. And, um, you know, um, I'm glad that we did what we did. I don't regret it, um, even though they did ultimately put up the wall in that. Regret it because, you know, um, our elders went through the, the periods of assimilation and they went through those, uh, that boarding school area you know if 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 we spoke too loud or if we did too much um we would be punished and our families we would be punished punished and you know there's there's that kind of and i don't i don't want that fear to persist persist um from the boarding school area i i definitely want the the children of the future to know that you know, even in the face of the of law, you know, not abiding by their own, um, you know, environmental protections and not abiding by all of those things that, you know, we have, you know, our own things that we believe that are, are cool. and that we're not you know, going to lose that because of because of this border wall, you know, that we are going to stand strong for our people. And I definitely do understand that, you know, not that don't agree with what we did. And that's okay. You know, I, you know, I think there's there's all all types of different ways to fight for our people. And some of those people who disagree with me or us and what we did are Next slide, please. Um, and that's just the <laughs> uh, calling uh, script that folks were giving uh, for us. Next slide. Um, when we were released. Um, after we took our actions, um, there were several um, other Otham who standed, who standed, who stood up. Um, sorry, I'm probably, as you could probably tell, I have a little bit of anxiety. Um, um, I, I do have a little bit of nerves, um, but um, there was, you know, quite a movement that um, that was uh, fought. And on to October, where there were several arrests um, on Indigenous Peoples Day, um, we definitely, um, as a whole, um, we definitely that we do care about our area, that we are still here, and that we will continue to fight. And um, I really want to thank each and every person that went out there and right, even when it costs, you know, their own freedom and even when it costs, you know, their own personal, um, you know, monitoring and all of that, because we are heavily monitored out there, um, you know, all before at the beginning of this presentation, um, when Trump started this, I, I kind of, I was at my wits end. We had just seen, you know, the, the starting of the Oh, my heart, it was very nearly on the ground. You know, it was, for me, I felt like almost all hope was lost, but because, you know, to know that my people, you know, our will other that has renewed my sense of hope and um yeah thank you for um, allowing me to present and um 
this is the end of my presentation. I'll be back for questions. Thank you so much, Nelly Joe, for uh, sharing with us. And um, I want to also acknowledge uh, people in the chat. I want to also right now pro, uh, open up the space for Amber uh, to share with us the about her, about her experience. after Amber's participation. Thank you. Ani abjoke Amber Ortega. Ani nyo joo Geneva one. Ani nyo og Melvin Ortega bapt and ani Oh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining. On, on matters that pertain to our area, our, our tribe, and he, he, he fought to, to reclaim, you know, what he believed um, needed to be reclaimed, which was our, our right to, to speak on behalf of our own um, When Border Patrol became present on the, the Hanawatham Reservation, they used, they made a lot of efforts to, they made a lot of efforts to keep us, um, they went, they crossed the line. They crossed the line to enter our properties, into her, um, our lives. Uh, my father, he worked early in the mornings and he would travel from the reservation to, to Tucson and he was harassed by border patrol agents and he would often have to take, um, he would pull over and he would defend himself. Um, they made it a cat, cat and mouse game where he, um, where they would, it was a harassment game. So growing up, my father, he, he told us, you know, that we were able to defend ourselves. Um, growing up in school, we watched as the presence of these vehicles grew. And there were often times where they would pull us over. Uh, my mother would be driving my sister and I to school and they would make a point to harass us. They would make a point to question myself and my sister. They would make us speak English. They would speak to us in Spanish. They would make my mom row down the window and they would make um, a point to, to intimidate us. And there were, it happened on several occasions. Um, you know, there was the message my father left us with, you know, um, you can defend yourself. You can speak up for yourself. Um, you can speak on something that you believe is um, not right. And as a teenager, I moved off the Tahnawatha reservation. And I remember experiencing for the first time what it was like 
to live a different around a different environment and speaking on the experiences I had growing up on the on the Tahanawatam reservation were difficult um, to explain to those increased there was a sense of freedom that I grew up having along with my family members we my we have stories in our family of when it was okay to to cross the border to visit family to to buy goods to um, attend a, a dance a ceremony it was it was part of our culture uh, before before the borders existed our people traveled along all areas um, of what's considered the the uh, border boundary line and so I grew up knowing that our lands were were special that our lands were where our our relatives lived for since time immemorial that the mountains connected us that our our stories our our language was real and so as I grew up, my father, he made a point to, to educate us on, on matters that pertain to our area, our, our tribe. And he, he, he fought to, to reclaim, you know, what he believed um, needed to be reclaimed, which was our, our right to, to speak on behalf of our own um, property, if you want to call that. So, in our villages, we have um, our homes. We have our our um, our villages. And when border um, when border patrol became present on the Thahanawatham Reservation, they used they made a lot of efforts to. They made a lot of efforts to keep us, um, they went, they crossed the line. They crossed the line to enter our properties, enter um, our lives. Uh, my father, he worked early in the mornings and he would travel from the reservation to to Tucson and he was harassed by border patrol agents and he would often have to take, um, he would pull over and he would defend himself. Um, they made it a cat, cat and mouse game where he, um, where they would, it was a harassment game. So growing up my father, he, he told us, you know, that we were able to defend ourselves. Um, growing up in school, we watched as the presence of these vehicles grew and there were often times where they would pull us over. Uh, my mother would be driving my sister and I to school and they would make a point to harass us. They would make a point to question myself and my sister. They would make us speak English they would speak to us in Spanish. They would make my mom row down the window and they would make um, a point to, to intimidate us. And there were, it happened on several occasions. Um, you know, there was the message my father left us with, you know, um, you can defend yourself. You can speak up for yourself. Um, you can speak on something that you believe is um, not right. And, As a teenager, I moved off the Tahanawatam Reservation. And I remember experiencing for the first time what it was like to live a different, around a different environment. And speaking on the experiences I had growing up on the, on the Tahanawatam Reservation were difficult um, to explain to those who, who were unfamiliar with, with that type of um, environment. And so my father did make a point to move my sister and I off the reservation. There was um, there was a lot to 
there was a lot he wanted us to to understand you know that there was um there were different ways of of living and approaching situations and you know at the time i didn't believe it was um trauma trauma um generational trauma of any sort um, but I, I know that as an adult, I made a point to to stay away from from home, from what's considered, you know, what will always be home. And my father on his end, he, before his passing, made a point to connect with his relatives who are Hiachiratam. So I grew up knowing I was Tahanawatam and that my grandmother uh, was Akmaratam. And so I knew I was Atam from both sides of my parents. And from my father's end, he learned later in his life what it meant to be Hiachiratam. And before his passing, his goal was to inform my sister and I of, of our relatives that extended beyond the borders, that extended beyond the Tahanawatam nation. And even the, even, even this side of the, um, if the border would, you know, the, so he wanted us to know that there, there's a history. There was a history that he wasn't able to educate us on and a history that was also not taught to us in, in the school. And it was, it pertained to being Hiachiratam and it pertained to the lands and our relatives. Um, so my grandfather, he was a traditional singer. He had a dance group and he made frequent trips to Quito Paquito. And his, his connection to the land, to the water, to the history is what pulled me to, to Quito Paquito. It was also the Ajo area. Um, Ms. Nelly Joe spoke about Aho and the mining operation. And so it plays into the history. So Darby Wells and Aho, they are where my, my grandparents met. They're where my grandparents worked. And it's also near one of the last uh, traditional Hiachiratam villages. So we, we, ha we have connections to the water, to the lands in that area as Hiachiratam. And when my father passed, I made a point to, to visit, to revisit and to connect with those who he was encouraging me to. And it, this was before border wall construction, um, learning about the the wrongs, the history, there is there's a lot that goes into what wrongs have been done to Hiachiratam specifically and the injustices. Um, the Hiachiratam were excluded from the Tahanawatam nation and there was years of effort put into um, fighting for acknowledgement for with the United States of America and then with the Tahanawatam nation. And after much, um, after much effort, after 20 plus years there, um, the Hiachiratam were then included into the, the Tahanawatam Nation and other surrounding um, federally acknowledged tribes, um, other, other bands of Atam, and the lands, the Hiachiratam lands were divided up into the Berry Gold water bombing range into the, there's the copper mine in Ajo um, and the Organ Pipe National Monument and we have lands and sacred sites that exist beyond the border. So there's, so before border wall construction, there was a strong um, connection, there's strong pull to, to be with the lands and the people and the history. And there is a document, it's called the Quito Pequito document. And it's one of the, only documents, um, one of the oldest documents that exist that can give account for who the Hiachiratam were, um, the water source, and even the burials, um, family, families that connect uh, beyond the borders. And one of the 
biggest messages was that we needed to carry on our our traditions, our stories, our who we are as a people um, because of these erasure efforts. And so there was a big effort to raise awareness within the community and within our, our families. We were a small group of people that came together um, and he had them. They're known as, uh, they're considered a, a patchy lake and you know we're known to to move to move um we have more nomadic ways and and apache like ways compared to the to the Tahanawatam. and you know there was a strong call for us to to ultimately connect with each other and connect with our lands and and our elders and you know we were aware of the there was there was media coverage happening and there was there were the event, environmental groups that were covering the um the issues and you know as individuals we did reach out to our our own nation you know the Tahanawatam nation um and on their end they there were efforts being made um but from the a traditional perspective you know, from reaching out to those who, who are grounded in our culture, grounded in, in Atham Himathak, um, you know, the, there was a different type of guidance um, being done. And, and what we were being guided to do was to pray and to sing and to, to make um, our presence known to the area, to the water, to the land, to our, our ancestors. Um, through song and through their action, um, showing showing them that look, we're we're here. We know these things are happening. We know that um, decisions have been made to construct a wall uh, to divide the lands, and and we know we knew that it was wrong. We knew it felt wrong. We knew what environmental damage it was going to cause. We knew the permanent. Um, damage that it was what we they would be facing the animals and we also knew that the um, there was a lot of resistance to um, saying something to actually doing something there was a lot of effort put into the political um, to politically discussing these matters but culturally, we, we had to reach out to our elders um, during this time, and we were guided to, to sing and to make offerings and to visit. And one of the difficult things we were facing during this time was um, the fact that Quito Pequito not only was home to our our history, but it was home to endangered species. Um, there's the pupfish, the Quito Paquito spring snail, there's the, the desert caper, there's the Sonoita mud turtle, there's um, sacred special animals that are only um, known to be found at that spring. And one of the um, things, one of the things that people were unaware of is that in our history, there was, when the lands were divided and taken over by the National Park Service, our, there was um, a dying off of areas where we grew. Um, there were farming areas, there were sacred plants, there were sacred, um, there, was, there was so much that was taken. Um, it was one of, Quito Piquito was also one of the um, other last villages for the Hia Chiratam. And it's, um, it was difficult. It was difficult to know what to do from, from a cultural perspective um, with the water depleting. We, we saw mass amounts of water being depleted. Uh, we, we knew, you know, for instance, it took 39 gallons of water to, to mix one, to mix um, this concrete. 
you know, for each mile, for mile for mile, um, groundwater was being pumped. And for them to, to, to see these tragedies playing out in our eyes, um, it, it was difficult. We, we were making frequent trips. Um, there, there was drastic changes that we were seeing happen right in front of our eyes with the increase of um, equipment, the increase of heavy, heavy machinery. Um, there was a crack in the in the spring of Quito Paquito um, that is that was needed to be repaired. Um, there are still repairs that are needed to be made because of these this construction. Um, Quito Paquito is a bird's nest. It's um, home to endangered species, and the damage we knew would be permanent. Um, and we, there was real fear for, for a major catastrophe for, because of ecocide, ecocide, you know, ecocide exists, um, extinction exists. And, you know, as Hiacharatam, that's, it plays into our story, you know, of, um, being considered an existent, an existent tribe, um, being thought of as non-existent. And, you know, we, when we came together as a group and as individuals, it was because we know our history, we're learning about our history, we're, we're educating ourselves on what matters have been done to harm our people, what injustices um, have been done. Uh, we, as Altham, have all experienced some type of harm by, at the hands of border patrol agents. Um, we're also aware of how they have been successfully able to silence our people and censor our people and, and how they've, um, and what they've done and, and, yeah, and gotten away with. Um, So I do want to uh, start with a couple of slides uh, from the day of the arrest. Okay, so this is, um, so not all of them are in order, but this is from, from the day of, we started off that morning It was early, we headed to the spring. It was routine for, for us to, to be, to first arrive and you acknowledge the water, you acknowledge um, you, it's, it's into mo moment, you know, we each were going through and we were in different ends of the, the area. And we both heard the, the sounds at the same time and it was the sound of construction vehicles. It was a sound of um, several approaching and parking. And it was, and it, it, it was, it happened so quick without hesitation. Um, you know, I, I know I, I ran to the, I ran to, to what's considered the parking lot and and she was there yelling, you know, we were, were both yelling for each other, you know, um, our hearts knew that that was the day they were, um, and they wanted to, you know, focus. They made it clear that that was the area they were going to focus on. And so we ran, it was, it, it was a quick, it, it was an instant like nod with like, no, no, this can't, this can't happen right now. Um, there was there was a heartache of Monument Hill um, of the demolition blasting of Monument Hill that um, you know was sitting with us. We we were unable to to effectively stop in any way. Um, nor was at the Hanawatha Nation the you know chairman and his efforts. Um, none of us uh, were were allowed to stop Monument Hill. The blasting of 
of a sacred mountain holding, um, you know, our our ancestors' bones. That was there's a story. There's a there. It was a historic story that we we carry um, true to who we are and in the mountain, its place, and you know there was um, a huge display of culture and sensitivity, and so we we knew that. Um, there were efforts being made on behalf of the Thahanawakam Nation. And that day we, we ran out and it was an instant, like, no, we, we have to do something. They, they can't break ground. They, they, they just can't break ground. There are no cultural monitors present there. This is a historic, this is a historic site. These, this is our history. This is our, our forever. This is, you know, never has a land been um, severed in this way, damaged in this way. We have been discussing it, you know, the heartache, the trauma, the land trauma, the, you know, the childhood trauma um, that we experienced, you know, with, um, at the hands of the United States government. And so in that moment, you know, we grabbed water, um, I grabbed my shulka, and um, this is Nellie placing herself, we ran, we ran to this this area and and she was the bravest one to you know before to to do this she um so she instantly placed her body and threw her hands in the air and and she was telling them no um if you can move to the next slide and so he turned around he he did a 360 and he attempted to to dig so there you can see the claw and he, he, he wanted to then try the other side. And in the background, you can see the water truck that is spraying behind him. And so this is part of their work. They, they would spray the road so other construction vehicles would have, um, so they would, be, they would drive much easier um, over the dirt. And, and so this is groundwater. So that was happening. He turned around and, and there we, we both stood and if you could go to the next slide. And so this is the land uh, before the border, um, before they broke through. And um, so this is what it, as it was um, the day of before, before they started and next slide. And these are the workers. Um, you can see them stationed all along the border. Uh, next slide. And then there is Nelly. <laughs> she um, so he he stayed parked, and I stayed on one end. And then he wanted to attempt again to dig on the other side, and she <laughs> she went ahead and ran and placed herself on the other end. And, and I stayed uh, where I was and we were both, you know, yelling him, asking him to leave. Uh, next slide. And so we were there for, for a couple hours. Um, I stayed put where on the other end and right across, you'll see the tractor and the bucket. And that is where um, Miss Nellie Joe was sitting. And while we were, I didn't include a video, but when they arrived on site, um, we were singing. We were taking turns back and forth singing. There was um, there was heartache, you know, that we were we were fighting. We both jumped on our phones and we made several phone calls and we asked um, we asked for support for people um, we you know to come out and and support what we were doing to to um, to see that there was something you know there was there was um, there was an injustice happening and
all we could do was sing in those moments. All we could do was really sing and pray. And we both knew what history was held in the surrounding areas. We both knew what wrongs were being done and it wasn't planned. And what happened after was, um, was this. So we had uh, border patrol agents arrive along with National Park Service. And as they stood there, we sang. And we sang and we sang. And there were um, attempts they made on their, on their behalf to speak to us. Um, but we continued to sing. And there were times where we also did attempt to educate them on the lands and the area um, and the wrongs that we believe they were committing by being in those positions. And there was, um, there was a real, there was a real effort for that we um, made into educating these people, these individuals on what lands they stood on and what our history meant and why we were there um, in the way that we were. Um, you know, one of the things that we work on doing is, you know, educating people that, you know, we exist beyond borders and barriers, um, colonial borders and barriers where we're led to believe that things are, are divided and, and, um, and we need to handle these things in divided ways. But from you know, our understanding, these lands, for instance, this road, um, this road wasn't a road, you know, hasn't always been considered a road. It's it's Hiachadatham traditional land, sacred land. And the parking lot is not a parking lot. Um, that is a colonial way of um, establishing um, a presence for for visitors under the national parks. Um, care and and so you know for us these these this is not a road um that border is not a you know that wall that line um it, it's a line um you you can't technically disconnect a culture that will forever be connected to the lands and and water and elements that have provided um we in our culture and our legends, you know, we um, were told how how we were created and why we were created, and part of our creation is um, part of this. Our story is that we come from the land. We literally come from the land. We literally were made from the land. And you know, as Hiachadatum, Hiachad means sand. Um, it's who we are, and there are different you know parts of what connect us to, to what areas. And there was, like Nelly Joe said, there was um, along these, this area is where uh, men travel um, on a salt pilgrimage. It's a sacred ceremony for men. It's a coming of age ceremony for, for young men. And they run, they run through and they make a stop at this um, water spring. And so it's things like this that we were attempting to, to share. And we were, we, were, we were doing some shouting and singing and um, we were releasing, releasing real trauma in those moments. And there was a, so we have border patrol agents um, recording with their cameras. And then in the background, you will see uh, two others. Um, and they arrived on site and have been um, so supportive and encouraging through this. Um, they have been documenting um, a lot of the things that we have been, a lot of the things that we did um, in terms of resistance. Um, and next slide. Oh, next slide. Those, those were all. Uh, oh, that was it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was the, those were the, um, that was the day. So Nellie Jo, like she said, she was carried out of the, um, of the bucket and they were asking me to leave. And 
I was I was asking them to leave first. Um, I was explaining that I wasn't resisting arrest, but I was asking them to to cease and desist and to take their weapons. Um, there was a successful intimidation um, tactic used. Um, they they would huddle and then they would you know disperse. And um, after they arrested Nelly Joe, you know they focused on 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 me alone and they um they made a slow encroachment and as they encroached um i yelled i yelled as as much as i could um in defense you know there there was there was real fear present for for the future for the future of the lands and um you know that this the destruction, it was disrespectful to our natural resources. It was disrespectful to our future. It was inconsiderate of, of our culture and the lands. And there are, um, there, there is a history of our people being removed. Uh, when the arrest was made, we were, taken to Court Civic and we were told we would be taken to Ajo. Um, one of the things we learned later is that normally in those situations, um, individuals are cited and released with civil infractions. Um, in our case, they arrested us, uh, took us down to Lukeville Port of Entry where they fingerprinted us, stri uh, strip searched us and um, gave us no charges. They then transported us to Florence, a core civic, a for-profit um, immigration detention center. And even that I can't stand using, but you know, it's a migrant detention center. They put us there. Um, there was a point where we were surrounded with men and we had to advocate for ourselves. Um, it was when Nellie spoke out to, you know, she requested to use the restroom and we, um, he was leading her to a men's restroom and I yelled at him um, and told him, hey, she's a woman. And he looked at both of us um, and said, oh, oh, and then he moved us. Um, there was no hand soap, there was no um, hand sanitizer. We had to advocate for that as well. Um, when given water, can you please use gloves? Can we please have soap? Um, we were not given any charges. We were not given um, access to call a lawyer. They told us that because it was COVID, they, they, um, they would require a, a phone without a line to reach into the cell. And they didn't have a phone that could reach into the cell um, available for us. And there was, um, there was our history sitting with us as we sat in these cells arrested. Um, our people have been removed from lands. Our people have been um, taken into prison. There's a story in our history of a family that was taken into prison, um, accused of killing their relative. And um, they knew that they, there, was, there was a wrong accusation, but the United States government um, removed these hiacharatam from Quito Pequito and they took them into prison. And there was, they were in prison for, for a couple of years and they walked from the Yuma area um, back to Quito Pequito. And, and when they returned to Quito Pequito, you know, they noticed how, how drastically different it was. And there was um, a decrease in the population of the people. Um, there's, there's uh, real abuses that, um, we are aware of that have been done to our people. And so we, we sat in those jail cells knowing that our government, the government, the United States government was against us, um, was going to prosecute us. And, you know, we, we have, we were released under pretrial service conditions, um, frequent home visits, frequent, appointments, um, urine samples. Um, they made a point to 
limit travel. Um, anytime I, I left my home address, um, I was questioned. I was questioned when I visited family members. Um, I was also harassed while visiting family members uh, by Border Patrol, by National Park Service. I'm sorry. They, they follow, Border Patrol, they followed me um, from Quito Paquito to Ajo to the Tohonawatam Reservation um, to Tucson, Arizona, um, down 86. Um, that's been my year since um, I've been released. Uh, I have an order from, I received an order from the judge yesterday. Uh, my lawyer was just as surprised, but it's a order stating I'm released from pretrial services. Um, how that affects the case now where we are unsure of. Um, I did request a new lawyer. Um, my journey through this has been difficult um, dealing with, um, you know, emotional, emotional trauma. Um, you know, Nelly spoke on your heart being on the ground and that is literally what it felt like. Um, there was a point where every hurt um, every wrong experience surfaced and, and came to, to yell at me, came to, to haunt my dreams. Um, they're real nightmares. Um, they're real. There's a real fight to, to reclaim who we are as, as, as women, as autumn, as, as people in this fight. For, for truth, for justice. Um, I chose to fight this case knowing that, um, you know, there was a, a big chance of us losing. We, were, we both received appointed lawyers um, and I was told by one that I would lose. She told me flat out, looked at me dead in the eye and told me I was going to lose um, without hearing any part of who we were, um, without hearing about the case. Um, she knew of the charges. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful right now to, to have a lawyer who's willing to fight this. I, I knew that I could be found guilty, but the point was to, to bring to light the truths that are done to our people and have been done. And and this is, you know, this isn't just for, for, for us, this is for our future, our future that has been erased. There, um, you know, you're welcome to, to look up Hia uh, look up the Haramatam, look up our border issues, look up the info, integrated fixed towers, look up, look up Ito Pequito, look up Arawapia, the history, the animals, the plants. Um, and then also remember too, you know, when you're, when you're sharing these things with people that, that the militarizing of the border, it, it, it affects these animals. It affects, it affects their well-being. Um, the severing of migration patterns. Um, you know, people are one thing, but animals and nature are there. And, and so, you know, this is, um, there are efforts being taken right now to, to revive, you know, Quito Piquito and the plants and, and to bring it back to, to, to its well-being, and um, you know, we as Hiachatam, we are a federally unrecognized tribe. Um, there is a history that that still needs to be told, though, regardless. And this is this is part of it. Um, fighting just this past week, you know, uh, my lawyer filed for a motion to reconsider the. The RIFRA, um, the fact that it was denied as a defense, um, it shows again, you know, that there is there is an injustice, and and thank you all, thank you all for being a part of um, being a part of this. Um, it means it means more than than you know some may be aware of. Um, and, and, and thank you for all your support. And I believe we're gonna open this up to uh, questions.
I, I believe we discussed um, folks can, if they have any questions or um, anything they would like to share, you could leave that in the in the chat area. And um, actually, <clears throat> Nelly, there is a question just came on the chat and it is, uh, what is the best thing people can do right now to support you both? Amber, would you like to take that? No. Nope. <clears throat> Um, Amber has a um, a, uh, a Venmo, PayPal, and a uh, Cash App, I believe. And um, I do as well. Um, I think that uh, there's, um, I don't have it on me right now, but we have a, um, something we can share to that effect. So that's definitely helpful um, as you know, um, it has been difficult uh, to keep up with, you know, the um, gas expenses and all of the things that um, we're trying to, to do to connect out there to um, remain close to home while also, you know, connected with, um, you know, what's going on out here with Amber and the courts. Um, so, you know, Amber could definitely use your support. I could use your support. Um, uh, in the future, um, we are setting up a fund for um, future attorney expenses. Um, and so that is to be announced. Um, that's, um, sorry, my cat's <laughs> creating a havoc right now. Um, <clears throat> But, um, you know, that's going to be something to look out for that, that um, you know, will be shared on uh, various platforms. And um, outside of that, uh, there's uh, what Amber just said, referring to, um, you know, finding out um, more about Hiachi Atom. Um, you know, there's, there's an article out in the National Geographic by, uh, uh, David Martinez, that's a, a very good article. Um, there's uh, quite a bit, um, you know, of history regarding, you know, the, the dismantling of the district and um, fighting for the district with the previous, you know, back in the 80s and 90s and probably even before that, because, you know, but there's just been a lot of work um, and uh, to get uh, uh, recognition amongst the people and also land, you know, and the original fight back in the day um, was to get land for Hiachit individuals, you know, who didn't get uh, reservation land. And so, you know, those, those are, are things that I think are important to, to think about and highlight and just the history of, of the, the National Park Service. Yeah, you know, a lot of folks, you know, think of it as this all encompassing, yeah, it's a place of protection, you know, but the reality was, you know, they were, there were very, there were, there were very much folks that were in the park service that were willing to protect, but, but there, they were also arresting us and, you know, working against folks that were trying to protect the land and ultimately, you know, upholding the Department of the Interior was issuing the closure orders, um, and so, you know, they're upholding a, a system which ultimately destroy, destroyed us or, you know, destroyed the area where we were from and not destroyed us. We're still, you know, living as a people, but um, <clears throat> I think it's, I think it's um, important to re-examine the, the history of the land you're on. Maybe, you know, a lot of folks stay out there, you know, camp and enjoy the scenery and whatnot. And, um, you know, before, this all began a lot of times the in the news clips uh are you know them weren't mentioned 
or you know, Hyachiratam weren't mentioned. And I think it's important to recognize that these histories exist. And um, if there's any silver lining to anything, I'm glad that people know that um, you know, Hyachiratam are still living and still caring and fighting about their land. Um, <clears throat> yes, and on the 15th, the 15th will be the verdict day. Um, so we're still waiting to hear back from the judge about the motion to reconsider the RIFRA argument. And she did take um, the off pretrial services. That was a surprise. We don't know what that means yet. Um, if we do lose, um, we can appeal the case and that, that will be that will be a whole uh, another part of the the journey and it was a big deal to to find new representation um there are arguments that could have been made um there there you know thing there it's important to fight it um to fight fight it and and right now it's it's um it's taking time it's taking over a year um, this has interrupted an immense amount of things. Um, there are, there's, there's heartache, there's work to be done. Um, connecting and understanding um, what lands, you know, you, your, what lands and people occupy your areas, um, building, you know, cultural competencies. Um, understanding self-determination <laughs> and um, supporting, even if it's not monetary, you know, prayer, prayer, um, prayer for things to change. Um, even it's, this is our future generation. We're preparing the way for, um, you know, I wouldn't want this to be done for, for any of our future generations because of the, um, because no of their desire hay. to know the truth. Okay. Es que no hay... Oh. And letters, yes, uh, letters can be sent um, in support. There is also a petition going around um, to drop the charges. And yes, thank you. Thank you to all those who, who do write um, letters um, to the US attorney and And keep an eye out too. We'll be, we'll be posting um, if there's anything in between. Um, we have done uh, press conferences and um, we have done uh, rallies um, to help, you know, to educate those who, who want to be a part of this and to understand, you know, what it is that we are doing. Um, For letters to the attorney, they're due on or before. They're due before uh, the December 15th date, and uh, there is a specific email address uh, to send those to, and the Water Protector Legal Collective uh, has that on their, on their website and on their uh, social media handles on, you know, directing specifically what email address to send the letters to the judge for Amber. Uh, and then addition, and in addition, as you just spoke of, the there's a petition on um, action Network. Um, the, I believe the Attorney General uh, just changed, and so we're changing who it's to, um, and we're in the process of doing that. Um, but um, you know, you can still um, the letters sent to the previous attorney will still go to the to the next one, I believe, and so um, keep keep uh, signing the petition. <clears throat> and so I, there was a Google form shared, let me, for the letters. Oh, cool. So we have that in the chat. 
is a, a Google form um, that we uh, the Sierra Club has to send out on behalf of Amber. <clears throat> what has happened to you is scandalous. Um, so really quick, you know, the government has made it difficult this past year and it did feel like, um, it, we, we know, it, we know they wanted to silence us. They wanted us to take the plea deal. Um, they made it difficult this whole year. Nellie, her experience was, was hard to, it was separate than my own, but we were both experiencing some real stress um, because of their, their consistent phone calls. If, you didn't, if we didn't pick up their phone right away or return a phone call, um, they would threaten us with jail, with calling the marshals, with um, also giving us a violation. And so with each violation, um, they, they threaten you to, you know, they threaten to take you into jail. Um, and so when Nellie went through her own difficult, difficulties with, with, with it being that way, um, they, made it so hard you know what she has experience that, that she can share you know um with when she was attending court um they they did they they made us feel like we were um like we were terrorists like we were these um like cartel criminals like we were some drug you know meals or something they made it feel like it was about that they um they were rude. They were hurtful to us. Um, it was. It was. It was an absolutely. Degrading it was degrading. <laughs> yeah. It was degrading. Um, questioning degrading. whereabouts. And to think that people go through that every day within the you know system, um, you know, especially you know through through federal charges and you know our experience from from core civic on on until you know now. And I'm so excited that. Um, you know, Amber's finally released from, from pre-trial services, um, that, you know, happened like yesterday. Um, and that was a huge surprise. Um, one of my heartaches, I, I'm sensitive, but when I was spending time with family, um, you know, it was important to, to get away from the noise, to get away from the city and every time they knew when I was away from home and when I was visiting family, that was the, that's how we know there's a collaboration happening. Um, but they would give me a hard time. And one of the things she brought up was how is it that you are, you cannot be at your home address? What is so wrong with being at your home address? Do you not live at home? They would approach us in that way. They would speak to us in that way. And it was, it was hurtful. Um, requesting to attend ceremony, um, you know, they're, it felt, it felt degrading at each response. Um, I had uh, two different free trial service officers and my last pre trial service officer, when I decided to move forward, um, I turned down the plea deal and I chose to fight the case to take it to the trial. And as soon as I made that decision, they gave me the pre trial service officer that Nellie Joe had, you know, had, and the way he spoke to her was hurtful. Um, I, 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 I watched her you know, crumble and, you know, cry because of how hurtful they were. Um, there is, they let us know, you know, that they made frequent trips to make sure that we were home. Um, surrounding the neighborhood, for instance. Um, so as of yesterday, I, I, I have been set free from pre trial services. Um, I am obligated to still, um, you know, attend court and communicate to my attorney. And she was just as surprised. Um, but but that's, um, you know, one thing we feel like maybe it was because of the coverage. Maybe they, you know, the word about how they treated us and what we endured has been getting out um, enough, you know, because it's it, the, the amount of tax dollars that was spent in, in um, taking us in. Um, we were kept for, for, two, for over two days um, without charges. About 40 hours. About 40 hours to be exact. But yeah, yeah, it was definitely an experience. And I remember, um, well, knowing Amber and getting to know her, she definitely lives up to her, her Hiache roots. And she like, you know, she has 
a lot, you know, <laughs> and family on different in, in areas, you know. And I like she, to travel. <laughs> and it's not just that her home isn't isn't just here in Tucson. Her home is out, you know, on the res and her home is out in Ajo and her home is out in, you know, Darby Wells and she goes, you know, out, you know, in that area with, with her uncle and her family. And so, you know, the, the, the constant monitoring, I saw the toll that that took on just your very, you know, being as, you know, as a person, you know, it was, you know, it, 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 it compromised your everything on, on who we were because you weren't allowed to be who you were that, you know, that Amber who's here and there and, you know, like, um, and, and I, and I saw how that, you know, really, you know, hurt you spiritually, mentally, you know, the whole thing. It's true. It, it did. <laughs> um, I do love being out and about. I, I am a spontaneous person and this has challenged my own sanity and <laughs> my own um, beliefs. This has been, um, this is forever. This is forever how we, how we fight this, how we move forward. Um, we could appeal the case. Um, appealing it would take it to the district court. Um, and, and there, you know, we were cautioned too because, you know, there are judges that were um, brought in through the Trump administration and, you know, they could strongly oppose um, it all. Um, you know, we were, our, our effort was compared to the insurrection at the US Capitol, which was also a degrading thing. Um, the judge's decision to, to deny our use of um, the Religious Restoration Freedom Act, you know, that was, um, I love, you know, my, my lawyer right now is Amy Knight and she, she made a great point, you know, that that was a narrow way of um, perceiving it. Um, they were saying that I still had, you know, the, the government didn't, um, there is no substantial burden because I still had access to Quito Pequito, um, but that's not true. They denied, they removed us. They, they forcibly removed us. And, and then um, they, they closed the checkpoint. They, I'm sorry, they closed the access to the spring. They closed um, the roads. Um, there are elders who can attest to that, that they were denied access to, to um, perform, you know, yearly ceremonies that, um, are done yearly in the area. Um, the government committed so many wrongs to commit, you know, to fulfill their um, their job, and and it was dirty, it was gross, it was messy, it's wasteful, and and that's the biggest part of it is the waste, the amount of waste um, that we have seen and we saw. We literally saw um, how wasteful of a job it was, and and you know, it's only a matter of time um, that that fence requires rust maintenance um you know that can what about the animals what about um replenishing you know what has been what's been harmed um what about it you know allowing us um access to our our sacred sites um that generations of them have been fighting for um you know we're told we have to work with and not against um but it it works both ways, and yeah, that was that was heart that was heartbreaking. Um, the effort to put our hearts on the ground, that's real. We had Trump supporters, we had community members yelling at us, yelling at us, uh, flipping us off, saying degrading things to us to our faces. Um, you know, we're survivors of so much, and and so much is um, has been denied denied to us, and. Thank you again. Thank you all for, for being a part of this. Um, we can't let the story of our people die off. Thank you, Amber. Uh, just there is one question in the chat about when will be the next court date and if people is able to show up in support. So the 15th will be the verdict. Um, and I believe the sentencing day will be when I'll be required to uh, be there in person. So as of now, um, 
I believe if you if you want to be there in person, it would be the sentencing day. And and we don't have a date for that yet. They said it could take take a couple months from the fifteenth for the judge to release a sentence. Just want to say I see all the words of encouragement and just thank you for everybody um, who's been supportive and you know um, your words mean a lot um especially you know just knowing that that um you know the lands and the people are supported and then also like just to reiterate what amber said like those areas are still in need of attention and you know sierra club is an environmentally based um, organization you know leading a, a you know that that's led a lawsuit against um you know the, the border wall and um, and so we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do in taking it down um, and repairing all of those areas, um, you know, and, and restoring those areas, making sure that the proghorn don't go extinct, that the jaguar and, you know, all of these animals that are suddenly without their family and kin because they can no longer, you know, go on their pathways, you know, that, you know, that they, they find a way home, you know? And so we, we, we definitely need to not forget about those efforts. And my cat um, agrees because he's uh, calling up a storm behind me. He's, he's in support of the animals. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nelly, for those words. It's just so, such an important, you, you, nobody could have said it better. Uh, I just want to say that this recording will be available to you all in the future. I'm just going to add uh, subtitles to it. So uh, after the finish of this webinar, I'm also going to make available the flyer that contains all the information for supporting uh, Amber and supporting Nelly Joe David with financial support that is much needed at this point. Also, uh, there will be also that letter that we're going to be passing around. Please uh, broadcast it, pass it around to your contacts. And I want to also just to finish and to be respectful for everyone's time. Uh, I wanna just thank everybody again. Thank you, our presenters. Uh, we recognize how difficult this is and how emotional and it's uh, and draining this process has been for you all and we as a community we thank you so much for being on the forefront of the struggle and giving us this inspiration to be able to move forward in a good way as a borderlands community that take care of each other and take care of the animals and take care of uh, our environment and the people that lives on it so you're just a great inspiration for everybody and I want to also invite everybody uh, to, if you're, uh, if you're able to, and to just uh, turn on your camera for a little bit and maybe say goodbye with a wave and a way we can see each other because haven't got the chance to see each other. Thank you so much. We are all here in community. So I feel very personal at this point, but you know, at least we can get to see each other and we stand for each other and we're here uh, working together to make this a better place. Thank you all, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you to the interpreters that did such an amazing job, Ashley and Gabby for translating all the information to Spanish today. Bye-bye everyone, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.